Take your Bibles over to 1 Peter chapter number 2, if you would. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Uh, we've looked at the rock in several different ways over the past several weeks that we've been doing this series. Uh, today we're going to wrap up our series uh, on the rock, and I want to talk about uh, the rock and, and look at uh, the use of that word rock or stone that is used in the Scripture, probably the most important way it is ever used in Scripture. We find it here in the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 2. And I want you to take with me and to turn your Bibles there and let's read verses 1 through 8 this morning. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2, starting at verse number 1, it reads this, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tested, or tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verse number 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion... A chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto uh, also they were appointed. And uh, we're going to take a look this morning at the head, the chief cornerstone. I want you to notice this morning in our passage, when it talks about the cornerstone and uh, the stone that is there, the living stone, it uses a word that is speaking of a person. When you're talking of a stone, you usually say it. That is a stone. It is a stone. But this stone is speaking of a person. And this person is none other than Jesus Christ. Amen. In this passage, we find that Jesus is the living stone. In our verse here, in verse number 4, uh, where it tells us that He is the living stone. And uh, it says, To whom coming as unto a living stone. Now, we're going to take a look at this living stone for just a moment and take a look at Jesus, who is the living stone. By the way, let me say that He is living and He is not like the gods of this world, which are dead, which are no good. And I'm reminded of uh, the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verses 4 and 5, where God is giving the Ten Commandments. God does not like even people to make an image that is made like unto Him and to worship these false gods. Amen. Uh, Exodus chapter number 20, starting at verse number 4, says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God. And so we find that God does not like these false gods that are made of stone, that are made of wood. And that so many times we say, well, I don't have a God like that. You may. God. It may be made out of fiberglass with four wheels on it <coughs> and an engine under it. God. It may be out there at the race course watching the races, or maybe out there watching the football team. God. It can be a God. God. Your God may be the house you live in. The friends that you have may be your God. It may be that you have a God that is a, has an engine on the back of it, and you take it out, and it involves a fishing pole every once in a while. Some people, whenever I was in college, 
God bless their hearts. They'd say that they went to Lakeside Baptist Church. <laughs> yeah. Or Roadside Baptist Church. Well, they were by the roadside and not in church. By the way, that is a lie. But people will make things like this their God. We better make sure that we do not serve a God that is dead in our lives. See, God Himself, Jesus is the living stone. He is the living God. Psalm chapter 115. Take your Bibles and turn there with me. Psalm chapter 115 this morning. Now I want us to see here in uh, Psalm 15 verses uh, 4 through 8 uh, about these uh, gods that are, not, uh, that are made by hand. And what the Bible has to say about them. Uh, Psalm chapter 115 starting at verse number 4. We find here in this passage where Jesus says, or I'm sorry, well, the Holy Spirit says, to the inspiration of His Word, their idols are silver, Psalm 115, verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throats. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. The Bible has some harsh words about those who trust in an idol, those who trust in something else other than God. He says here, these, by the way, if you take a look at the description, here you find that this idol or this image, it has eyes. But can it see? It cannot see. It cannot hear, though they have made and carved ears on it. It cannot speak, although they have carved a mouth on it. It cannot say anything. You may make a, a hand and hands that would maybe stretch out, but it cannot carry something for you. You may put feet on it, but it cannot walk for you. It cannot do things. By the way, the God I serve, He can hear when I pray. He can see my problems. He holds me in His hands. He moves with His feet to what I am to comfort me. And that is the God I serve because He is a living God. He also speaks to me in the Holy Spirit as I read God's Word and His Holy Spirit speaks to me. He speaks to me. Those idols do not. They are dead. By the way, somebody who puts their trust in anything else or anybody else other than Jesus Christ is like those idols. They are dead. Amen. Amen. And we find here that God is a living stone. Jesus is the living stone. He is not dead. He is indeed alive. Amen. Over in 2 Kings chapter number 19, we find the story of King Hezekiah, one of my favorite kings of Israel. Of uh, Judah, excuse me. Uh, one of my favorite kings of Judah. Love King Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter number 19. And we find here he's been threatened by a man by the name of Sennacherib to come and to destroy King Hezekiah and Judah. And they built up their city. And here's Sennacherib saying, don't trust in your one God. He says, I've destroyed and he lists all these people that he has conquered their land. And he said, they had many gods. See, they lived in a time, which we do today, by the way, they lived in a time where they were polytheistic. They believed in many gods. And he said, I destroyed all these people and all these gods. And you only have one God. By the way, that's all I need is one God. I don't need a bunch of gods. I've got one God because he is the living God. And King Hezekiah is afraid. So what does he do? He begins uh, to pray to God. Verse 17. He begins to speak to God. Notice. He says, of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands. Verse 18, and have cast their gods into the fire. He's saying, Lord, they have destroyed. They're telling the truth. They're very powerful people. They're very mighty people. They have conquered many nations. They have cast all of their gods into the fire. But notice. For they were no gods. Amen. The world may think they have a lot of gods. The world may think they have a lot of answers to their philosophy. 
philosophies and yeah. all of their, uh, even their worldly theological systems and their ways of thinking and, and the way that they do things. They may think they have a lot of answers. They may think they have God. They have no gods. Right. They are no gods. But the work of men's hands, <laughs> wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, verse number 19, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Amen. He says, I don't need a bunch of gods. You are my God. You are the living stone. You are the one that I look to. You are my deliverer. But he is also... The eternal God. He's, he's not made of hands. He's not wood or stone. He is the eternal yeah. God. One yeah. verse comes to my mind automatically. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.17 Now unto the King, a capital K, right. I-N-G. That's a proper name for right. King Jesus, by the way. He right. is King, eternal, right. immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Yeah. Be yeah. honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Yeah. He is eternal. He is everlasting. These little false gods that people set up in their lives, whatever it may be, it may be their tradition, Amen. the way they've always done things right. with their family, the way they've always seen things, what they've always participated in. All these different things that they look at, they set them up as gods. By the way, if you follow anything that is against God's word, whether it's a tradition with family, whether it's a tradition of going to celebrations you ought not to, and it goes against God's word, that becomes an idol. Right. Amen. Amen. And I will tell you that idol will, will be defeated because it is only temporary. Amen. That's right. Whatever that is in your life that you set up, you say, well, I'll tell you, I just, uh, I, I've always done it. I'm just going to keep doing it. I've always thought that, so I'm just going to keep thinking that. That's always been the way I've done things. That's always been the way that I've seen things. I'm not going to change. And you are setting yourself up for failure. Amen. Right, right. You're setting yourself up to be defeated. Because right. you're setting your own philosophies, your own thoughts about the Word of God. Amen. If somebody can take the Word of God and show you where you're wrong, you had better change. Right. Because if you don't, you have just made that thought, that practice, an idol. The Word of God is supreme because God is eternal. Amen. Our verse tells us in our passage in Second uh, and First Peter, excuse me, chapter two, verse number four: "To whom come as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men." That word "disallowed" means rejected. See, when men saw Jesus, when men saw the living stone, they rejected it. Now, here we find a cornerstone, and I did some research as I studied cornerstone. I don't know a whole lot about masonry. I do know a little bit, uh, but I don't know a whole lot. I worked with one or two. But what I understand of masonry and of the building, and put it, especially with rocks, is you have to find one particular rock that is firm, that is solid, that can hold all the weight of the entire building. It is your cornerstone. It is what you build everything on. It is your foundation. And it becomes your cornerstone. This is what Jesus is. And see, uh, I, I reminded, this is of wood, but I reminded of, uh, with Isaac working in construction, we'd go to the lumber yard, we'd look at wood, and we'd go, oh, that's crooked, don't want it. We disallow it. See, we reject it. Don't want that. It doesn't look good enough. Reject it. And here's the thing, when the stone came to men, they looked at him and go, oh, we don't want that. He's not beautiful. He's not anything significant. That's what people said of Jesus in his time. He's no one real special. See, Isaiah in prophecy, Isaiah 53 tells us in verse 1, Who hath believed thy report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That's what the people of Israel saw in Jesus. There was no beauty in Jesus. Why would he be the cornerstone? Why would he be someone of so importance to the children of Israel? And they did not realize that they're rejecting him. They were actually rejecting the cornerstone. 
John 1, 11 said, He came into His own, His own received Him not to fulfill the Bible prophecy. And in Mark chapter 15, take your Bibles and turn there with me, Mark, uh, Mark chapter number 15. I want you to see the actual act of them rejecting the cornerstone, the foundation, the living stone. He was rejected by men. Men looked at Him. They rejected Him. We do not want this man. We do not want him. Mark chapter 15, verse number 9. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the, children, that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. Verse 12. They chose, by the way, a thief and a murderer above the chief cornerstone. Yeah, and Pilate, verse 12, answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil have ye done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him! And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. The chief cornerstone rejected by his own people. But let me just say this. I'm thankful that he was rejected so I wouldn't have to be. See, he was rejected in my place. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, here it is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. Right. The word propitiation is that of substitution. He's right. our substitutionary sacrifice. Had Christ not been rejected by men, I would be rejected by God. Yeah. So Jesus came to die on the cross. Take your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. I want you to see this with me. Jesus was rejected by men, but He did it for a reason. He knew what was happening. He is the living stone. He is eternal. He was rejected by men. Romans chapter 3. We all know the first verse I'm about to read. So for some reason, I don't even know if most people know that Romans goes past and Romans chapter 3. But it even goes past verse 23. But it does. <laughs> it does. And we're going to read past into unknown territory. <laughs> Romans chapter 3. Verse number 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace, not by your grace, not by your works, but by His grace and His grace alone. We're all come short. We're all unworthy. We'd all be rejected by God because of our sin. We need a stone to come and be disallowed by, the, by men. Because if He had not been, I would be rejected by God. But the stone came down because we were falling short and we are justified freely by His grace right. through the redemption yeah. that is in Christ Jesus, yeah. whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation that is a replacement right. for what I deserve, a propitiation through faith in His blood. Yeah. People say, oh, that Christianity, it's a blood of religion. Yes, it is. Yeah. I'm thankful for it. Yeah. Yeah. People trying to get rid of the blood and the hymns. Try, people trying to not preach about the blood. You can't be saved but by the blood. Yeah. It has to be through the blood. Yeah. We find that it is propitiation through faith in His blood. By the way, just believing that Jesus is a good man will not get you to heaven. Amen. Even just believing that Jesus is God will not get you to heaven. You must place your faith in Jesus and the work He did on the cross. Amen. And through His blood you are saved. Amen. I believe that there's a God. It's not good enough. Right. Even the devils know there's a God. Doesn't mean they're going to heaven. Right. You're not going to see Lucifer walking in heaven even though he believes that God is a God. No. Right. no. People say, well, I'm, I'm okay because I think that there's a creator out there somewhere. Not good enough. Right. His name is Jesus and he shed his blood Amen. for you. To declare His righteousness. Because right. our righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags. Amen. So He has to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins. Right. That are passed through the forbearance of God. Yes. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness. That He might be just. Yes. And the justifier of Him which believe Amen. in Jesus. You see, it is Thank Jesus who came. And though He was rejected. By men, he did it so I can be accepted by God. Amen. Amen. Preach it. And had he not come to die on the cross for my 
sins, I would be rejected by God. That's right. But now we have a way. As a matter of fact, we have the way. Just that I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, as what Jesus said. You cannot make it to heaven in any other way, by any other way, but through Jesus and his blood. If you're a born again Christian, by the way, did you know that Jesus makes us living stones? Right. See, in our passage, we find in verse number 5, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, ye also as lively stones. Amen. The stone, the living stone, Jesus, makes every one of us that are born again lively stones. Right. And let me just say that uh, the word lively there means to be quick. That means we're alive. We have so many Christians walking around with feet. We have so many Christians walking around depressed and downhearted and discouraged and, and looking at the world and all the things that are happening, they're discouraged. You're alive in Christ! But he makes us living stones. Notice though that at one point, if we were made living, that means at one point we were dead. At one point we were dead. Colossians chapter 2, turn me over there. Colossians chapter 2 this morning. Colossians chapter number 2, I want to start reading at verse number 8. Colossians 2, verse number 8. We find here, beware, as you're trying to, I'll start reading Colossians chapter number 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Right. I don't have time to get into that. That is a good message. Yes. Right. Yes. Do not be deceived by, just because somebody has something that sounds good by a good philosophy. They think it's philosophy, you better watch it. Right. Alright, anyway, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. By the way, if a philosophy is anything other than God's word, it is of man. Right. right. Just thought I'd throw that out there for you. Now, let me get back to the topic here. Now, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, Amen. for in Him, that is Jesus, dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. Jesus is the Godhead. He is God the Father. He is God the Son. He is God the Holy Spirit. All the fullness of the Godhead in one body. That's Jesus. And ye are complete how? In Him. And only in Him are we made complete. We cannot be complete in our own works. Right. We cannot be made complete through our own philosophies. Right. We cannot be made complete in our own stubbornness. We cannot be made complete through our own desires. That will not complete us. Right. Only Christ will complete us. Right. It says, ye are made complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. In Him also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism. I'm passing up a lot of good sermons right now. Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen uh, with Him through the faith of the operation of God. <laughs> That's good. Who hath raised Him from the dead. Let me say, uh, read this passage without taking a fat man to, a, <laughs> to a, an all-you-can-eat buffet bar. You just don't know where to start. I'm trying to stay focused there. I'm here for this. Verse number 13. And you, here we are, being dead in your trespasses or in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Sin has made us dead. We are dead because of our sin. We are made hopeless because of our sin. We are made helpless because of our sin. Because of our sin, we are heading to a real, literal burning hell. This is what sin has for us. And we were already dead because of our sin. Oh, but I'm glad Jesus came. And He made us alive. Notice as we continue reading, had He quickened, that is living, had He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all, there's a big debate and big discussion about can Jesus' blood forgive all of your sins? Amen. Yes, it Amen. can. Amen. They say, well, I don't know if it can forgive my future sins. I don't know. I think it can forgive my past sins. I've heard that. And I don't know about my present sins. I'll have to get reborn again for that. My future sins, I don't know. But I'll tell you what. Think about it this way. 
Because when Jesus died on the cross, all your sins were already in the future for him. Amen. Try. Try. He died for all of your sins. Amen. He's outside of time. Try. So when he died, he died for every one of them. All. Amen. All. Trespasses. Amen. Amen. Verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting Amen. of ordinances Amen. that was against you. Amen. And which was contrary to us. Try. And took it. Out of the way! Yeah. Keep reading. Yeah. Out of the way, nailing it to his yeah. cross. Yeah. That sin, that trespass, that will take you to hell. When you receive Christ into your life, he revived, he quickened your body, and he made you spiritually alive again. Right. And he took those trespasses yeah. on yeah. you. And he went and he nailed it to the cross. Yeah. Right. And he moved it out of the way so God no longer sees it. Right. He only sees the cross. He only sees the blood. Yeah. He's good. moved. He's good. Nailed it to his cross. Yeah. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Notice, he made a show of them openly. Triumphing over them in it. Yeah. He wasn't just a little. We get excited when we say victory in Jesus. Jesus didn't just have victory by the skin of his teeth. Wow. No, he did not. He had victory, I believe, at the day that he died on the cross. Whenever he did that and shed his blood, he already had the victory. Yeah, right. And he made a show of death, fell the grave at that point. And when he rose again, I think it was just kind of going, I told you I had victory. Right. Right. He already had the victory. Yeah. Right. And he showed it openly. And I'm thankful that Jesus makes us alive. Well, one time we were made dead. We we're born dead, but Jesus makes us alive. <laughs> Christian, Jesus is our foundation that we are built on. Right. He is the cornerstone. Right. Yes. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5, He also as lively stones are built upon or up a spiritual house. Now, I know about physical houses. Physical houses, you have to have a solid foundation for it. The same is true for a spiritual house. Right. Ephesians chapter number 2, let me quickly wrap up here. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon, there's that spiritual house, right. are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Right. Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone right. in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth uh, unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Right. Let me just Amen. say this. We look back and we always talk about the apostles and their work. They are part of that foundation. But I want to tell you something. The chief cornerstone is Jesus. Right. He is the chief Amen. cornerstone. Amen. And I found out one thing when I was working construction. I found this one thing out. When you're doing work, you better make sure everything is all square. It will not fit together like it should. Right. And let me just tell you this. Jesus will make sure your life is fitly framed right. the way it should. Right. And that is exactly what he did. Amen. As we see in our passage, in him all the building fitly framed together. Amen. That's Amen. what Jesus does. Right. He takes all the rough edges off. He works on that. And he makes it where it will fit together. Amen. And that's what Jesus does. He is the chief cornerstone. Let me finish by saying this. I don't know if every person in here, you, every person in here may be born again. But there may not be somebody who is born again in this room. Maybe somebody is lost. And if you are, you're faced with a decision today. And you can either accept the stone, Jesus Christ, or you can reject the stone. By the way, if you reject the stone, the Bible says he's become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. I didn't even get to that today. In other words, you are without excuse. You know that Jesus is the only way. He is the foundation. He is the stone. He is the living stone. And if you reject him, he uh, will. Uh, you will be cast into an eternal lake of fire. Amen. That's right. But Christian... Today, let me ask you a question. What are you building your life on? Are you building your life, your testimony, 
on Jesus the rock? Are you making Jesus your foundation for every decision, for everything you do, every activity you participate in? Is, is he your chief cornerstone? What if the Bible says something that you don't like? We always like to say amen about things the Bible says about other people, but when it comes to us, I don't know about that, brother. I don't know about that preacher. What are you building your rock or your life on? What rock? <coughs> By the way, if you build your life on anything else, it's a fallible rock. It's a rock that's going to fail you. Are you living like you are a lively stone? Or are you living in defeat? You have the victory. Right. So you can live in victory. Yeah. You've been quickened. You've been alive. You've been made alive. You're not dead. You have the victory. Yes, right. I want to invite, if there's any lost people in here today, I want to invite you to come and receive the living stone, Jesus Christ as your Savior. But today, Christian, I invite you to once again build your life on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. All right. See, the hymn writer said this, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So today, come back to your foundation. Come back. And it's here that you're going to see that you have victory. Where right now you may be living in defeat. The altar is open today. I ask you today, where will you, what will you do with the living stone of Jesus Christ? Bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Nobody looking around.